Tonight, the human toll of the war in Ukraine, two years on. We're on the ground as Canada trains Ukrainian soldiers headed to the front lines, outgunned and badly outnumbered. Car thefts surge in the Maritimes, but most aren't being shipped overseas. There's at least one, two vehicles every day that's being recovered. Why many people get their stolen vehicle back. Toxic drug deaths in Alberta hit record highs. Rock bottom kills. The province is spending big on addictions treatment, but critics say it's not enough. Safe supply will not solve the problem. There's no... But it'll keep people alive, isn't it? We break down Alberta's approach to the drug crisis. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Henemansi. Ukraine is marking the two-year anniversary of Russia's invasion, revealing for the first time in a long time how many troops it's lost to the fight and hinting at its future plans. President Volodymyr Zelensky says a new Ukrainian offensive is coming, but he's not revealing when. What's clear is that the country is looking for more international support. Some will come from Canada, but will it be enough? We have reporters in the region tonight. Margaret Evans is in Kyiv, and Evan Dyer is in the capital of neighboring Poland, Warsaw. Let's begin with Margaret in Ukraine, where this is a weekend of commemoration and pleas for more help. The frozen ruins of the Battle for Hostomel Airport near Kyiv. One of the first warnings that Russia had begun its invasion of Ukraine two years ago sounded here. Russian airborne troops seeking to make a bridgehead to march on the capital, eventually repulsed. An apt place then for reflection as Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky marked the second anniversary of the war this weekend and thanking visiting allies for continued pledges of military aid. But promises have been made in the past and the question remains, will they be delivered soon enough to make a difference to Ukrainian fighting forces on the ground now? At a major government conference on Sunday, Zelensky announced that 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed in the war, a rare admission and less than half of American estimates. And all around the world. Asked if Ukraine will win, he said it depends on Western allies. If we're well armed, if we have weapons, we will not lose the war, he said. We will win it. His defense minister calculated the costs of delays in promised help. Commitment doesn't constitute delivery. 50% of commitments are not delivered on time. Whatever committed that doesn't come on time, will lose people, will lose territories. The human cost is impossible to ignore along Kyiv's wall of memory, lined with pictures of Ukraine's fallen defenders. This soldier, call sign mechanic, signed up just after Russia's full-scale invasion. He was a D-miner at Hostomel Airport after the battle. Now he trains soldiers in the field. They're getting eight mortar rounds per day, he says. The Russians have hundreds. It's not enough. The Russians are pushing and pushing, he says. The more they do, the more that symbolic battle at Hostomel Airport seems to hang in the balance. Margaret, Ukraine has struggled on the battlefield lately, but, but today Vladimir Zelensky hinted at big plans ahead. Yeah, he said that he has, Ukraine has a new battle plan for 2024, but of course he didn't divulge what it was. You have to assume there's also some messaging in there for Moscow, and he did say that he believes Russia will begin an offensive in the spring or summer. He was also sending some messages to his allies. He's walking a line between not wanting to appear ungrateful for the aid that Ukraine has already received and sounding alarm bells. He said that that his allies, that Ukraine's allies know that they need to get their weapons delivery systems for Ukraine in place and sorted out within the month. Margaret Evans reporting from Kyiv tonight. International aid has been pledged this weekend, including new help from Canada. Evan Dyer is in Poland, where Canadian troops are training Ukrainians, helping to prepare them for the brutal fighting to come. 
In a muddy field in Poland, Ukrainian troops are learning from Polish and Canadian instructors how to dress wounds, apply a tourniquet to stop bleeding, and medevac a casualty, all skills they may soon need on the front lines. The Russian military is targeting medical assets. Basically, the Ukrainians do not fly the Red Cross because it just makes them a high-value target. In a sign of some of the basic equipment that Ukrainian troops are lacking, Canadian trainers here have started donating first aid kits to them when they go back to the front and also want to give them this. This is a Canadian stretcher, kind of like a crazy carpet that allows one soldier to drag another across the ground. Often in the combat zone, Ukrainian soldiers are reduced to removing doors from abandoned buildings to use the stretchers. So the need is uh, the whole range of weapon and ammunition, starting with uh, armored vehicles and artillery shells, finishing with drones. NATO countries have promised to provide a million drones this year. But NATO admits an earlier promise to provide a million howitzer shells by March won't be met. Ukraine now wants long-term agreements to give it more predictability. The West is there for the long haul. And so Canada will give Ukraine $320 million worth of military assistance this year, as well as backstopping $2.4 billion in loans through the IMF. The EU has given 50 billion euros, but a $60 billion package of aid and arms from the U.S. is being blocked by Republicans. What we see is that we need a plan B in case uh, the Congress in the United States doesn't come through, in case there's a President Trump that gets elected, um, and in case the Ukrainians uh, cannot hold the defensive lines. And for the soldiers here, that's a pressing concern. They know they'll be badly outnumbered at the front and without more help, badly outgunned. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Warsaw. Sweden should soon be cleared to join NATO. Hungary's parliament is expected to ratify Stockholm's application tomorrow. All NATO countries must approve entry. Hungary was the last holdout. Sweden following Finland and joining the alliance driven by the war on Ukraine. There appears to be new progress tonight towards a temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The U.S. says the basic outline of the deal has been reached. As Katie Simpson shows us, it comes amid another deadly weekend in Gaza. The frantic rush, the surge of a crowd to help pull survivors from the rubble, the desperate attempts to save lives. Witnesses in Rafa say an Israeli airstrike targeted a home, killing at least eight people. They say it is a safe area, but we have people being killed each day, this man says. There is no safe place in all of the Gaza Strip. The Israeli military released new footage showing what it says is the destruction of Hamas targets in locations across Gaza. Fighting that continues amid word a temporary pause may be on the horizon, according to a senior U.S. official appearing on an American political talk show. It is true that the uh, representatives of Israel, the United States, Egypt and Qatar met in Paris and came to an understanding among the four of them about what the basic contours of a hostage deal for temporary ceasefire would look like. More negotiations are expected in Qatar this week, but expectations for a breakthrough are being tempered. Uh, if Hamas goes down from its delusional claims and goes down, can bring them down to earth, then we'll have the progress that we all want. The Israeli prime minister says whether there's a temporary ceasefire or not, eventually Israel's goal of destroying Hamas will require continued military operations in Gaza's south, including Rafah. We can't leave the last Hamas stronghold uh, uh, without taking care of it. Obviously, we have to do it. More than a million displaced people are already seeking shelter in Rafah. And while Israel says it will develop an evacuation plan, after nearly five months of war, there are fewer and fewer places for civilians to go. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. New federal legislation is expected tomorrow, cracking down on cyberbullying, hate speech and sexual exploitation. It's called the Online Harms Act. CBC News has confirmed it will include the creation of a new regulator to police online platforms for harmful content. It will oversee a digital safety office separate from the CRTC. Nikki Haley says she's staying in the Republican primary race despite losing badly in her home state to former President Donald Trump last night. Paul Hunter is in South Carolina, where many Republicans are already looking past Haley to the general election. 
An even bigger win than we anticipated. Another big, easy win for Donald Trump. With such a margin of victory in the South Carolina Republican primary, a victory presumed by all even beforehand, some South Carolinian Trump supporters we met at the polls told us they'd voted for Trump's rival almost out of pity, knowing Trump would win regardless. You mind if I ask who you voted for? I voted for Nikki Haley. Why? Uh, because I didn't want her to be embarrassed in the state since she is a South Carolinian. I um, was going to vote for Trump, and I will vote for Trump after he beats her and runs in the general election. For Trump, it's now four wins in four states in his bid to be that party's nominee for the White House. For Haley, his only remaining serious challenger. I couldn't be more worried about America. It seems like our country is falling apart. She's pledging to stay in the contest despite America Trump's big win. I'm a woman of my word. I'm not giving up this fight. But senior Republicans are now pressing her to reverse that position and now call it quits with a firm message to Haley. I think at this point you got to do a lot of soul searching. No doubt about it, because, you know, it, you reach a certain point where if you go too far, you begin to do yourself politically more harm than good. With a primary in Michigan up next for both parties, the push is to get Trump free of Haley to focus on U.S. President Joe Biden, even though he's largely doing that already. God bless you all. Himself presuming, like so many, this fall will indeed be a Biden-Trump rematch for the White House. Paul, you mentioned the Michigan primaries on Tuesday. Joe Biden is facing his own challenge in the state. Yeah, he is. Michigan is home to a huge population of Muslim and Arab Americans who are being urged to hold back their votes for Joe Biden in his party's primary in that state over what they say is his failure to stand up for Palestinians in Gaza. Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who leads Biden's campaign in that state, says that would only strengthen Donald Trump, and that, she says, would be devastating. Paul Hunter in Charleston, South Carolina, tonight. The Quebec government is appealing to the Supreme Court to try to stop asylum seekers from claiming subsidized daycare. This after a recent ruling found its daycare policies discriminatory. Sarah Levitt has more on the legal battle and the families left in limbo. At the Welcome Collective, this woman picks up free food. A single mom and an asylum seeker from Angola, CBC News is not naming her as she fears for her safety. She's been in Montreal for a year, caring for her one-and-a-half-year-old daughter day in and out, until finally a lifeline. It's been a joy, she says, to have her daughter in subsidized daycare for the past week. The Quebec Court of Appeal recently ruled the province's policy barring asylum seekers from subsidized daycares was discriminatory. It opened the doors for many, like this woman, to get affordable care for their children. Now, though, the government says it's appealing the decision. It's like they're putting a chain around my neck, she says. The Quebec government says the cost is just too high. We are very near to the breaking point. So having the court imposing us to offer another type of services to asylum seekers, we're just saying that the capacity is not there anymore. The province says as many as 5,000 asylum seekers are looking for subsidized daycare spots. Tens of thousands of others are also on wait lists. Still, advocates argue asylum seekers need the most help. These are some of the most precarious and vulnerable people in Quebec. They're here. Um, they get work permits because we want them to integrate our work force, but we don't allow them a place in subsidized daycare. No sabía cómo comunicarme. Leila Orillo says she couldn't communicate when she came from Peru with her family four years ago, but French classes weren't possible because private daycare was too expensive. She's now been granted asylum but worries about other newcomers. It's a barrier to integration, she says, something the government should consider in its appeal. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. The spike in auto thefts across the country is hitting New Brunswick, but with one big difference. In provinces like Ontario or Quebec, stolen vehicles are rarely seen again. As Alexander Silberman shows us, cars in Atlantic Canada are more frequently recovered. 
New Brunswick cars are being stolen almost daily, with thieves targeting parking lots, city streets, and even right out of driveways. It's all part of a spike in auto thefts across Canada. But unlike Ontario and Quebec, most stolen cars in this region are found. Uh, when a vehicle is stolen and containerized and uh, exported out of the country, that's one of the great indicators that uh, it's, it's long gone. The bulk of stolen vehicles in Canada are being exported overseas, but a new report says cars in New Brunswick are taken with a different motive, to commit other crimes. The recovery rate for stolen vehicles in Atlantic Canada is 67%, far higher than 44% in Ontario and 37% in Quebec. This impound lot is where dozens of those recovered vehicles are getting towed. Most of these cars were found after being abandoned by thieves, who often try to burn them. It's a tactic criminals use to attempt to eliminate fingerprints and other evidence from a crime. Just right here, we got three cars that have been stolen. Doug Short started a group to help people track down vehicles after one of his own tow trucks was stolen. Since I've started towing, I've seen it uh, oh, over triple in uh, means of stolen vehicles. We found them abandoned in uh, campgrounds. We've found them all over the place. Equity Association, which supports the insurance industry, is calling for an update to federal regulations. So anti-theft measures are required to keep up with new technology. Uh, making the vehicles harder to steal, whether that's through the uh, manufacturer or aftermarket uh, solutions. It's a complex problem. There's no magical solution. Until then, Short expects stolen vehicles will keep arriving at his lot. Alexander Silberman, CBC News, Moncton. Tonight, many of us at CBC News are remembering the humor and hard work of our colleague, James Murray. Even here in Toronto, where snow on December 25th is never a sure thing, there's white all around, the ice looks great, and Christmas cheer is easy to find. As a reporter, writer, producer, and host, James contributed to every major news program. Across Canada and overseas, he covered wars, disasters, and politics with a keen eye and a fierce loyalty to public broadcasting. James died this weekend in Nova Scotia after a long struggle with cancer. Colleagues here remembering him as friendly, funny, and unforgettable. A lost cell phone found by an Air Canada employee is causing a dispute between the owner and the airline. Finders keepers, losers weepers. That's not an accurate summation of the law. Why police are now involved. And creating a home in Newfoundland after fleeing the war in Ukraine. After school, I am going to a uh, job and uh, <laughs> I'm happy. The joys and the challenges. Plus, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro backwards. It was absolutely stunning. I pulled my eyes out. The emotional reason for the jaw-dropping feet we're back into. Well, this was the last day for skating on Ottawa's Rideau Canal this winter. It will be closed after tonight and won't reopen until next season. The canal was only open for 10 days this winter. That makes it the second shortest season. Last year, it didn't open at all. Lynx Air was flying for the last time today. As of midnight mountain time, the budget airline will be grounded. The shutdown was quick and shocked some passengers. Lynx Air blamed it on rising operational costs, high fuel prices, and government regulations. Air Canada is not compensating an Edmonton man for his lost phone, even though it was last seen in the hands of an airline employee. As Carolyn Dunn tells us, the passenger has photographic evidence that the airline isn't backing down. I was hoping that my mobile tracker will save me by finding my device. Olu Awase was trying every trick he knew to help find his lost phone. Last October, the Edmonton man accidentally dropped his three-month-old pricey Samsung phone before his family boarded a flight from Toronto to Edmonton. Once home, Awase opened a security app called Bitdefender. It alerted him that someone had tried to unlock his phone, and to his surprise, an Air Canada employee in full uniform was staring back at him were obscuring his identity. At first, Awasei was relieved. I think I'm in good hands. So if it's an employee of an Air Canada, 
that found it, then I'm okay. Air Canada emailed him to say it had identified the individual in the picture you provided and conducted an interview with them. And the employee and an eyewitness reported the phone was returned to the lost and found area, specifically at the Air Canada customer service desk. After that, the airline lost track of the phone. And that email would be the last time Air Canada would correspond with Awasei. After weeks of online chats and emails with the airline, Awasei is no closer to getting his phone back. So that made me believe this was a case of a theft. In a statement to go public, the airline said Air Canada did not have responsibility for this phone as it is a personal item. Finders keepers, losers weepers. That's not an accurate summation of the law. But this civil lawyer says Air Canada is likely liable. When someone comes into possession of someone else's property and that person's identification is known, they do have obligations to return that property. Olu Awasei is not giving up. He's lodged a police complaint and hired a lawyer, hoping Air Canada will pony up the approximately $2,000 he owes on his lost phone's contract. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Two years after the war began, many Ukrainians who came to Newfoundland are struggling to find stability. The clients are very nervous about what's going to happen, what comes next. The source of their anxiety and calls for action. And Alberta's efforts to fight addiction. We see drug use go way down over time. Met with anger over the lack of a safer supply. We don't have enough room to show you who all our friends are, but all of our friends are gone. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Canada has become a safe haven for more than 250,000 Ukrainians displaced by war. Nearly 4,000 have settled in Newfoundland and Labrador. Heather Gillis shares some of the triumphs and challenges newcomers are facing as the province prepares for more. She made it. Alina Holinska is learning English at the Association for New Canadians Language School in St. John's. Today's lesson, banking. Uh -huh. Interest, good. <clears throat> Holinska arrived in September 2022 and has lived through Russian rocket attacks. And kill mm, too much people. Holinska's brother is a soldier wounded in Bakhmut. She calls him a Ukrainian hero. But while her thoughts are in Ukraine, Holinska says she's settling in here in Canada. I have my class learn English. I have a job. Yes, I have a job after school. I am go to... Uh, job and uh, <laughs> I'm happy. She's one of nearly 3,800 Ukrainians now living in Newfoundland and Labrador. The province opened an office in Poland to help people immigrate and find jobs, even chartered flights for some. Others have come here on their own, like Victoria Lamia Shonak and her newfound friend Valentina Korzak. Both have jobs, but home right now is this Holiday Inn while they look for rental housing in a tight market. It's really difficult because I have three children and I need a three-bedroom house and it's very expensive. The salary not uh, very high, um, but, but we really try. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Association of New Canadians is expecting an influx of people from Ukraine until the end of March because that's when the emergency travel program for Ukrainians comes to an end. And to see the amount of... Elizabeth Ares says there I is uncertainty the about what will happen understand. once ongoing settlement help expires next year. Our clients are very nervous about what's going to happen, what comes next. And we can't give them answers at the moment. And, uh, you know, we just re reassure them that we're there for them and we will be there to help them every step of the way. Meanwhile, Holinska knows one thing. She wants to stay in Canada forever. It's my dream, yeah. What about next Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Now we go deeper into the news shaping our world. Does Alberta's model for helping addicts save enough lives? We're treating thousands of Albertans every year. They're spending big to get people off drugs and into recovery. But critics say tainted street drugs are still pushing up the death toll. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. And the province won't make safe supply a priority. This is The Breakdown. 
I went to Alberta for a first-hand look at the province's push to get people into recovery and to hear why some say it is not enough. Yeah, so the pharmacy is, has your medication, it's all ready to go. You have to do one witness dose, but you'll be given six carries, okay? This isn't your average call centre. The people on the other end of the line are desperate for help. It sounds like he's been having multiple overdoses that are documented. And for Albertans seeking help, this call centre is open seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Addiction counsellors, social workers and nurses assess each person to see how they can help them to stop using drugs. So then you, you don't feel the need to use, you know what I mean? Which is exactly what Suboxone should, should do for you and Subblocket as well, as long as you're on the right dose, right? Is there another room like this elsewhere in the country? This is the only program I know of like this. It's based right here in central Alberta and Pinoca. Alberta's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, Dan Williams, took us for a tour. He says people from anywhere in the province, from big cities to remote rural communities, can get help. We're treating thousands of Albertans every year, and they get that immediate same-day access to evidence-based medication that brings relief to them, and it allows those people who had no opioid addiction to have a, a, a gasp of air um, and, and lift out of their addiction for a moment and we hope and it seems to be this is the start of their journey on recovery. On average, the staff here connect about 19 people a day to a doctor who can prescribe Suboxone, which eases withdrawal symptoms, or methadone, an opioid used to ease addictions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nathaniel Day is the center's medical director. The reality is then we will shoot that prescription directly to the pharmacy that you've chosen closest to where you live or work. And then you'll be able to go into the pharmacy, see the pharmacist and start treatment today. Any idea of long-term outcomes for them? The fact of the matter is, is we see drug use go way down over time with the, with the patients that we care for. And we see overdoses go way down over time. It's like a hockey stick. Dr. Day was one of the authors of a study that concluded 90% of the people in this program have remained in treatment for six months. After 12 months, that number drops to 58%. That call centre in Pinoka and this treatment facility in Red Deer are two examples of what the provincial government calls the Alberta model, focusing on treatment and recovery as the best way to tackle the drug crisis. So this is the gathering space. This is where our, uh, our main community meetings happen. With its airy public spaces, from a gleaming gym to a theater room, this addiction treatment center feels less like a health institution and more like a nice motel. Um, so we have single occupancy and double occupancy rooms. Yeah. And being able to get into a single occupancy room is one of these things that you move along in the process. You know? Open nine months ago, up to 75 men and women can stay here at no cost to them. This is one of two new publicly funded addiction treatment centers in Alberta. The other is in Lethbridge. In all, the province plans to build a total of 11 over the next three years. In total, they could treat more than 2,000 people a year. The government says it's added 10,000 treatment spaces since 2019. I almost lost custody of my children and I was able to do intake through a phone and call. The facility arranged for us to speak with three residents. Given the stigma around addiction, we agreed not to show their faces. And how long did you have to wait between the time you made the call and the, you could walk through the door? Only about a week, yeah. which is unheard of really, usually waiting lists for months and months. The government says wait times are always changing, but when people get into the centre, they can get treatment for up to a year. The connections that I've made is, is huge, right? When, when you have the short-term pro programs, it's, it's easy just to fall back into the same people and the same crowd. You're eight months here. How do you feel about, about your prospects after you leave here? Um, I just know that if I do the things I need to do here and bring them into my, you know, my life when I leave, I have a very good chance of succeeding. But addiction is often a lifetime struggle. Will more treatment spaces in Alberta significantly reduce the number of people taking illicit drugs? What data do you have on the Alberta model? Is it too early? Do you have numbers that say that the Alberta approach is actually making things better? So the data is that we see 10,000 new spaces, almost all of which is full in Alberta, and we see thousands of lives of people who otherwise would have um, been through addiction that are now living in recovery. 
The government concedes it doesn't yet have the data on the impact of the Alberta model, but Williams makes it clear. He believes treatment is the solution to the toxic drug crisis. The only way out of this is if at a large scale, a government comes in and says, we know that recovery is a path off of addiction. If you don't build a very expensive and sophisticated system around recovery, of course you're going to continue to see more deaths. But for all the optimism about access to treatment, a grim number hangs over the province. 1,706 people in Alberta died from illicit drug poisonings in the first 11 months of 2023, the most recent number available. That's more than five Albertans every day. Lives which many experts say won't be saved by making addiction treatment the focus. You must find all of this very frustrating. Yeah, I think like to be focused so much on preserving what we have and mm -hmm. to not expanding or um, trying new things, it's, it is extremely frustrating. And like I said, the statistics really show that we're not doing enough. Elaine Hishka is a professor at the University of Alberta whose research focuses on the public health approach to substance abuse. Alberta is boldly focusing on treatment. Do they have it right? I don't think anyone that says there's one solution to the problem of drug poisoning has it correct. And if you look at our statistics, the numbers speak for themselves. We are on track to lose potentially over 2,000 people this year, more people than we've ever lost in Alberta. And so I don't think our current policy approach is working. And I think evidence-based public health approach would include not just effective treatment, um, but also harm reduction. We are not taking that comprehensive approach and I think we're seeing the results. Harm reduction is one of the pillars of British Columbia's response to the drug crisis, including supervised areas to take drugs and providing to some a so-called safer supply of uncontaminated drugs. BC believes that approach can save lives. Alberta's United Conservative Party is adamantly opposed to safer supply, saying it facilitates drug use and ultimately drug deaths. At the party's annual general meeting last November, members voted to end provincial funding of supervised consumption sites. It's not binding, but it does reflect how the UCP feels about harm reduction. Do you think politics is what's driving the approach of the government here? Yes, yeah. I mean, I mean, politics drives the approach of all governments um, to some extent. But I think in the last few years in Alberta, we have seen a lot more politicization of the issues. The best thing that we could do is bring people indoors to safe sites. In Edmonton, outreach groups, independent of government, are trying to fill the gaps. We want to encourage everybody, if you don't have a naloxone kit with you, do you want to take one? Chanel Twan invited us yeah. to join her team as they walked the downtown streets. Yeah. Okay, so there's foil, push stick, water, cookers, sharps, pretty much everything you need. They're focused on what people who use drugs need right now to stay alive. And do you need anything else? Straight shooter kit, rig kit, naloxone, straight shooter kit? Those kits contain clean pipes to smoke drugs. They also hand out naloxone or Narcan, which can be injected to revive someone poisoned by drugs. So we're going to put the tip of the needle now in the bottom of the juice, and we're going to suck it up. So I'm going to let you do it. Okay, you want to take that? If you can push, point it down. In 2016, we lost 353 uh, people here in Alberta, and so that's almost one a day. Now here in Alberta in 2024, we're losing five people a day. We know the numbers are a little bit more dire in British Columbia, but it's just, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And we're out here literally with naloxone, um, trying to put naloxone on bullet holes. In Edmonton, like many cities in Canada, drug use is sometimes very public and deeply disturbing. On top of having supplies, can we get everybody some naloxone? And in the age of fentanyl, one you hit you can be one? deadly. Will more treatment help address this? Immediately, if we're talking about bringing people indoors and saving lives tomorrow, it's safe consumption sites and safe supply that are gonna save lives. But I think the government here in this province would say increasing access to treatment, increasing treatment facilities is the answer. 
I would tell those government officials uh, and I would invite them to come and have a walkabout like you're doing today and, um, and hopefully maybe that will help them open their hearts and minds to the reality that folks are actually dealing with out here. This is actually probably my favorite picture of him. Um, he's with his daughter. When we come back, she believed abstinence was the answer to drug use until her son died. What would have saved his life? Options. Safe supply will not solve the problem. There's no... But it'll keep people alive. It will not. A grieving mother casts doubt on Alberta's approach to cutting toxic drug deaths. Sometimes rock bottom kills. Do you need to be adding another part to this approach? Safe supply will not solve the problem. Here's part two of our investigation. You brought some pictures of Lakota, and I just wonder if you can tell me what memories they bring to mind. He was so handsome. <laughs> yeah. He was a really handsome kid. Every death from drugs has a story. And U of A assistant professor Sarah Oje wanted to tell us the story of her son, Lakota, who died just before Christmas of 2022. This is actually probably my favorite picture of him. Um, he's with his daughter. He was a father, a loving son. He was also a binge drinker who sometimes used drugs. Oje believed Lakota needed to hit rock bottom to turn his life around. She was wrong. The rhetoric around abstinence and sobriety and recovery and all that is you have, you know, you have to hit rock bottom and as a parent, you've got to practice tough love. Sometimes rock bottom kills, often right now in, you know, in the province and the country today, rock bottom kills. Lakota lost his apartment and moved in with his mom. But when he started using again, she said he had to leave. Yeah. She believed the answer to her son's demons was to just stop using alcohol and drugs. That was my focus with him. Just get him sober and he'd be okay. There are so many things I know today that if I had known differently then, I would have absolutely approached his use differently. What would have saved his life? Options. Options. If he had known about harm reduction measures, would he have used them? The answer is I don't know, but he should have had the option presented to him because I do believe he wanted to live. Lakota is part of that tragic statistic, the growing number of Albertans killed by toxic, illicit drugs. I asked Alberta's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction if these deaths prove his government's approach to the drug crisis is too narrow that it should include supplying access to a so-called safer supply. Do you need to be adding another part to this approach that says, yes, treatment, yes, recovery, yes, some version of harm reduction, but even more because we're clearly not reaching those five people a day? What has brought us to this crisis is the exact logic and reason that they say we need to double down on. Safe supply will not solve the problem. There's no... But it'll keep people alive. Won't it, it will not. Safe supply will facilitate more addiction. I don't believe safe supply in the least is any version of harm reduction. What I say to Canadians watching this unfold on both sides is we have a choice in front of us. There is, There are clear lines drawn. Um, is it that handing drugs out to drug addicts and the model of harm production that it's become is the path forward? or is it going to be investing heavily in recovery so we don't see any more of those scenes on the street that you saw yesterday? These folks are all people that come from our community, that we love, that we have relationships, that are no longer here, that we miss. After Chanel Tuan took us on a tour of those streets, there was one more thing she wanted to show us. Every one of these faces, each card, is from a funeral or memorial she's been to. We don't have enough room to show you who all our friends are, but all of our friends are gone. And, um, Every card, a son, daughter, in many cases a father or mother, most of them killed by poison drugs. We will continue to keep showing up 
um, in light of inaction and we will continue to keep filling these gaps as we see them. Um, but we don't want to see anybody else's loved ones added to this um, pile. We would uh, obviously tell Canadians, please don't wait to give a shit about other people until it's somebody that you're connected to, to somebody that you love. Whatever the solution, each one is a reminder of the overwhelming loss. With no sign, the crisis is easing. You may be wondering how the rate of toxic drug deaths compares between BC and Alberta. Based on the latest numbers from each province, BC had 4.5 deaths per 10,000 people last year. Alberta is projected to have 3.9. Experts we talked to said those numbers show both provinces have more work to do to find the right balance of harm reduction and access to treatment. We're also investigating another major issue, ransomware attacks, and the hack that took down Canada's largest public library system. A major delivery, months in the making, and it's only the beginning. Dominic Lolino expects it'll take him three weeks to unload it all. It's a big backlog and they're like 12 hour days. All hands on deck because of a hack. The Toronto Public Library gave us exclusive access to follow them for weeks to find out what happens when a criminal organization targets you and how hard it can be to climb out. Knowing that our data is somewhere has been quite challenging and difficult. We look up some major hacker groups on the so-called dark web because we want to understand how they operate. Turns out they often list their victims. The criminal groups know that not everybody is going to pay. In fact, they account for that in their business model. And for everybody who does pay, they are essentially financing three more victims. Our inside look at how the Toronto Public Library is rebuilding after a ransomware attack. You can catch that story tomorrow right here on The National. Coming up, a unique approach to climbing one of the world's tallest mountains. Uh, he took me by the shoulders, looked at me dead in the eyes and said, you've done it, you're at the summit of Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world. His method and his motivation in our moment. This is Ben Stewart at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Scaling Africa's tallest mountain is already an impressive achievement, but this particular journey came with a twist. Stuart completed the entire trek while walking backwards, all while raising money for charity. And tonight, his achievement makes our moment. Uh, he took me by the shoulders, looked at me dead in the eyes and said, you've done it, you're at the summit of Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world. And I said, Nelson, I've got to get back down. I'm the first person in history to walk up and down Mount Kilimanjaro by walking backwards. It was absolutely stunning. I bawled my eyes out like a little girl. It was super, super emotional. But I think more about the weight off my shoulders for the sponsors, for the charity, for myself, for my granddad, that actually I'm going to do it. So it was kind of a sense of relief. At the core of it is, is we're raising money for the British Heart Foundation here. My granddad died of a heart attack a few years ago, a personal trainer. So health and well-being and, and heart health, I guess, is, is really, really close to me since coming back in terms of the emotions of the whole trip is to put it in black and white equally the most uplifting yet challenging week of my life so it appears climbing backwards is a thing he's not the first person to climb kilimanjaro going backwards, but the first, as he pointed out, to go up and down. The numbers, by the way, uh, six days to get up, two days to come down. And his fundraising goal, by the way, fairly modest. He only wants to raise about 34,000 Canadian. And right now he's managed to uh, raise uh, about 8,200. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah Mansing in Vancouver. Good night.